Hello and welcome. I am Susan Spears, President and CEO of the Fredericksburg Regional Chamber of Commerce, and I am your host for today's episode of the Leader to Leader podcast. Our guest today is Dr. David Sam. Uh, David, welcome. Good to be here. Yeah, I'm happy to see you. Uh, for our listeners, Dr. Sam is the former president of Germanic Community College here in the Fredericksburg, Virginia region, and he is now working on uh, several things. He is a poet and freelance writer, an adjunct professor, an editor, a mentor, and uh, I don't know, maybe a retired person? Technically, for <laughs> it's coming up on five years now. It's hard to believe. <laughs> Amazing. And I had to put mentor in there because Dr. Sam is a mentor with our Leadership Fredericksburg program, and he has been ever since arriving in town, and the program was new. And so I love it that uh, even though he retired from uh, Germana and he was a member of the chamber board at that time, um, you being a mentor with the program has really kept us connected. So I really appreciate you continuing to do that. Well, I appreciate the opportunity do it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, for our listeners, um, this is our second time getting together for the Leader to Leader podcast. Um, Our first episode together, if folks want to go back and listen to it, was published on September 2nd of 2021. And really, we were diving into some stuff with leadership and your leadership journey at the time. And we had such a good time. I said, I definitely want to have you back. And then recently, we reconnected about Uh, the topic that the Chamber is really spending a lot of time on this year in 2022, which is civility. So um, you and I had some good conversations about it, and I thought, let's go ahead and do that on the podcast as well. So let's just dive right into into it. You you told me you wanted to share some stuff about civility and your background and stuff. So let's go for it. So, um, you know, how did I come to concern myself about it, I guess, Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm several parts of my life. Uh, Go back to when I was at the university. I went to school way back in the dark ages, in the late 60s and the early 70s. And when I was in public school, one of the complaints, the only complaint teachers had about me was that I didn't speak up in class. When I got to the university, I came out of my shell. and I became more and more comfortable uh, speaking up both in class and elsewhere. And I discovered I was a pretty good speaker, and I enjoyed doing it. And I found out that I was also really good at arguing and debating. And we had a student lounge where a lot of us hung out and got to know each other and formed some friendships there. And informal debates about the topics of the day or whatever would occur and I found that I, I could often win them. And a, a friend of mine at the time said, you know, I, people just don't realize you know, how good you are. You're like a, a person wielding a sharp sword. When you're done, they walk away and parts of them fall off. Oh, that's interesting. Well, that didn't sound uh-huh. like a compliment. Uh-huh. And the more I thought and felt about that, I realized I was so focused on winning the argument and using whatever tactic, rhetoric, logic, whatever, to succeed in that argument. And I used a different metaphor, that I would charge up the hill, the hill being winning the argument, and I get to the top of the hill successfully, and I turn around and look down, there's all these bodies. Hmm. Well, they weren't literal bodies. Right. But I I said, "This, this is not a good thing. It's good to win an argument, I guess, but at what expense? Now, this is in the context of the late 60s and early 70s, right. where we had civil rights and race uh, as issues. We had the Vietnam War. We had students' rights and responsibilities on campuses all coming together in protests and demonstrations. And there were some radical students who thought the way to stop bombing in Vietnam and Cambodia was to bomb here. And we had people on the other side who attacked peaceful student demonstrations 
with baseball bats. Hmm. Now that's the logical conclusion of using verbal violence to win your point. Verbal violence damages people, so it's bad in itself, but verbal violence can lead to actual physical violence. Yeah, sure it can. So that's really where I started thinking about this. But along with that, I got appointed to some positions and got involved in student government. My first mentor, Dr. Milton Foster, was a professor that saw me as a leader when I didn't. I mentioned him before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I found that I had the ability to bring people together who disagreed and come to some agreement and actually do something useful. And that seemed better than leaving a bunch of bodies behind. So that's really where my thinking and feeling about the issue of civility and civil discourse in relationships, in organizations, in schools, and in society, that's where I guess it began. Yeah, with that self-realization. Yeah, that, yeah. that what did I want to achieve? Did I want to win? Or did I want to be effective? Did I want to win the argument or the negotiation? Or did I want to be, be able to achieve, to achieve some purpose, at least partially, and yet also preserve the relationship? So as you, as you changed and shifted in your thinking, how did that become apparent? Like what were the action items that, that you took on and started to notice a difference in how you interacted with others? Well, the first thing is have some respect for other people. Mm -hmm. You don't have to like everybody. Mm -hmm. I, of course, have always been amazed that there's some people that just don't like me because <laughs> I think I'm just really wonderful. Of course. <laughs> I'm exaggerating a bit. Um, but if you don't start with some mutual respect, mm -hmm. then, you know, you got a problem already because uh, disrespect can lead to dehumanization, which makes it easier to uh, mistreat other people. So, and then I, the other thing that helped was after college, I went into retail. I had worked at my parents' store, I worked in another store, and then I came back to cover the business. And for 12, 13 years, I was manager and then bought into the store with my time and owned half of it. If you didn't treat your customers with respect, you probably weren't going to sell much. Right. And, you know, that's what I lived on was what I sold. <laughs> so there was a self-interest in treating people with respect as well as a, a moral and an ethical reason for doing so. Right. You and I have that in common with a retail background. And I think um, some of us are f more fortunate if it comes more natural to us to be relational and respectful and kind. Uh, we, we tend to do better <laughs> in those fields. I made it all the way to the last day that I was in retail before I had a real complaint. And honestly, you guys, I mean, you know that's because I just went ahead and let all of that go on that last day when that customer <laughs> came up and I just was like, oh, I don't care. I don't have to be nice to you right now while you're being awful, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, well, I fired a few customers yeah, in sure, my day. Yeah, sure, sure. I remember when I was, was working in the store while I was at the university helping my parents out, my dad said, you know, there's some people you don't need as customers. Those are people that abuse the relationship, mm -hmm. they steal, or they, um, they're they just, you know, they're, they're, the amount of profit you're going to make on them just isn't worth it. Right. Now, there aren't many of those. You put up with an awful lot. Sure. But, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a few that are so disrespectful that it's just not worth it. Yeah, I'm a firm believer everybody should spend some portion of time dealing with the public, whether that is actually on your feet in like a retail customer service setting. Restaurants. Yeah, yeah or any, any, <laughs> anything else, because like you and I both, like today, if 
if I go out to lunch with a friend or something and they're rude to the folks that are helping us, I'm mortified. Yeah. I, I, I don't understand. You know, what, what is that feeling of um, truly incivility? Right. All of it ties back in together. Right. It's your reputation. It's, it's how you, it's the vibe you put out for humanity. Well, and, and you've been there, so, yeah. you know, in, in service mm-hmm. work of any sort, mm-hmm. um, too many people treat the humans who are doing those services as if they're part of the furniture. Right, right. And so I always, you know, if somebody has a name tag on, I'll say, thank you, Jim, or whatever the name sure. tag says. You know, when I'm dealing with customer service on the phone, you know, I'll, I'll say, who, you know, what, what's your name again? If I didn't write it down already. Now, partly it says because I want a record that yeah, sure. a certain day and time they agreed to something. But it's also so the last thing I can say is, thank you, right. Phil, Phyllis, or whatever. Mm-hmm. We were trained at one store I worked in um, to say the name three times in the transaction, like as you're, yeah. you know, closing it. And it, it sometimes felt really goofy. But on the other end, as they're listening to you, it's like, it feels warm and fuzzy, you know, to hear someone referring to well, you. Well, your name is important, mm-hmm. you know. That's why when when there was a name that uh, I had trouble pronouncing, the person, you know, often from a, a different culture or something would say, you, you don't worry about it. I said, no, I want to worry about it because your name is your name. That's part of who you are. Right. And get it right. <laughs> that's, that's that respect yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah. So much of... Um, today's world you know everything just repeats itself in different ways you know new styles new technology etc but one of the the big trends you see right now um, around civility and um, human interaction is people avoiding that interaction right Um, and and one of the terms that came out I think since maybe in the last two or so years for the pandemic was this cancel culture but really it was, it is to say, if you are different than me, then, yeah. or I, I have morally judged you for some terrible thing that may have come out of your mouth or something I think you did, or just the way you, you look, maybe, then you're, you're canceled. Well, yeah, there, there's different reasons for denying somebody mm-hmm. their, their existence. Yeah. And, and one of them is you just want to reject what they're saying. Well, the first time I, you know, you mentioned avoidance. That's mm-hmm. the first thing that happened. Um, in the 80s, when I was making a career shift and I was teaching for the first time, sure. um, part of what I taught in composition was logical argumentation. So the ultimate paper was to write a research paper that argued a certain position. Well, the first thing I discovered was students equated argument with fight. right. Right. The logical argument, of course, is a step-by-step uh, rhetorical uh, discussion that shows your thinking, your evidence, uh, leading towards some conclusion you're trying to advocate for. That's different from a fight. And what I found was most of the students didn't want to have an argument or a fight. They wanted to avoid it. And um, so I actually created, a, I think I created it myself, although often I steal these things, but I don't remember everybody, anybody having done this. I created an exercise that I've used mainly in class, but you could use mm-hmm. it in a business or organization too, sure. where I got two volunteers, one who was comfortable being blindfolded in a room, and then put one in one corner of the room, one in the other, and the, guy, the person with the blindfold was in one place. And then the rest of the class or the group would arrange the furniture into a maze. Then I'd have another volunteer time and another volunteer count as the person who wasn't blindfolded talked the person who was blindfolded through the maze. And they took, how long did this take in terms of time and how many times did they bump into something? Hmm. Then we do it a second time, put them back in the same corners, create a new maze, but this time the person who isn't blindfolded goes over to where the blindfolded person is and guides them through the maze. 
And then I would ask the students or the group, why'd we do that? What does that mean? They'd eventually come on. Well, first of all, you've got to go to where the other person is. You've got to understand why and where they are. That's respect, but that's also, if you're going to guide them through your argument or through the furniture, you've got to know where they are. And, and then you can guide them through. And of course, when it was done where you held their hands, it was much faster and many fewer bumps into furniture. Now, at the end of that metaphorical guidance, People may go back to their respective corners, but at least they understand the other person and why and where they are. And that's something. And that's, you know, civil society depends on that. Democracy depends on that. And effective organization depends on productive conflict, not destructive conflict. Right. So we can... We don't have to agree about everything, but we can communicate and discuss issues together and find common ground. and um, Or agree not to have common ground. Right. Agree. And often, you know, I, uh, last night, I'm, I'm, I'm going a little off track here, but last night I was listening to a song I'd been meaning to pull out from the 80s. It was, hadn't heard it in a long time, but it's by Sting, and it's called Ru- Russians. You know, but the the big line in it that I, I posted on my Facebook, Sting says, um, we share the same biology regardless of ideology. Believe me when I say to you, I hope the Russians love their children too. That was in 1985. And and it really, it's, it's, it's a really, everybody has that love of something, and usually right. it's family, right. um, whether that's kids or spouses or whatever usually there's something there that's a common ground no matter what you know right. so finding finding the common place there and then common humanity yeah common humanity and then and then working through those other pieces like like how you see it and, and I then, mean if you want to mm-hmm. uh, in a war kill the other side yeah. or metaphorically in right. an argument uh-huh. you you dehumanize them you make them less than human, and yeah. you know that's that's part of that mutual respect. Is um, there are some psychopaths and some people that are just so weird and different that it's hard to mm-hmm. empathize and understand that. But most of us love our children, love our parents, sure. are hopeful for similar kinds of things and afraid of similar kinds of things. You asked, you know, what else do you do? Well, this is maybe as hard, if not harder, which is, you know what? I might actually be wrong. Mm -hmm. That's one of the first things you have to start with, that on something that you have believed all your life or that you're passionately committed to, you still, at least theoretically, might be wrong. Because when you begin with the idea that you're right and the other person is wrong and you're right at all costs, then you leave all the, that hill of bodies behind, literally or mm-hmm. figuratively. Yeah, and so, so why does this thinking matter? Like this is a, you know, I represent our local business community. Why should this matter to people in business? Yeah. Well, first of all, if you have an organization that's three or more people, you have politics. <laughs> yeah. Now, politics is often a dirty word. Yeah. Politics comes from polity, the, the common government. Um, but in an organization, there's politics because of coalitions mm-hmm. that are either permanent coalitions or temporary coalitions. And those coalitions form around common interests or perceived interests or common ways of seeing the organization. Um, And so when you have groups of people who see the organization and the world of the organization a certain way and they disagree with that worldview with others, um, that can 
cause conflict right away. Right, right. Because when you're trying to get people to move in a common direction, um, some of them will rebel against it because they don't see the reason for doing that or even see it as a threat to the way they see the world. So there's another reason as a leader, you don't know everything. You don't have all the answers. And the more complex your organization, the more complex the environment of your organization, the more likely is the decisions you're making have long-term impacts. But the feedback loop is really fuzzy. The decision you made today might not come to fruition for years. Maybe, you know, some of the decisions I made as president 10 years ago might still be boiling right, right. And, and causing some things to happen. So if you don't, if, if there's a lot of ambiguity well, and the feedback loops are fuzzy and a long time between decision and result, do you just throw your hands up or do you make arbitrary decisions? The best thing is to have productive conflict where people who see the world differently individuals or coalitions can talk about them, surface them, and then I guess my faith is, but my experience is also that the decision that comes out of that, whether it's a a group decision or an individual decision, is more informed and is probably going to be a better decision, or at least a less bad decision. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, there's a good reason right there for civility because, well, for, you know, when, when you hold the position of power, you know, I supervise 700 employees. Mm-hmm. And so in terms, you know, I would ask sometimes in a training session, who's the most dangerous person at Germana? And some were confused and some were embarrassed to say, well, David, you are because I was president, I had the most power, so I could do the most good or the most harm. Sure. Um, Well, one time there was, I forget what the issue was. I think it was a statewide change in community colleges. Mm -hmm. And as the CEO of the organization, I had to explain to people what that change was and then administer and carry out the change with their help. So I needed their understanding and support. So we had an all-college meeting where um, all of the full-time and many of the part-time people were there. So we're talking a few hundred people. And I knew when I would say, you know, here's what it is, here's what's going to happen, and then ask for questions that probably there wouldn't be any. For two reasons. One, people don't like to talk in public. And two, they don't want to bring up something that they're concerned about with the person who has the most power. Well, before all that happened, because we'd already put out what the change was, three people came to me and individually confident, courageous people and said, here's my question, here's my concern. Mm -hmm. And I answered it and they said, thank you. And I said to the three of them, now, here's what I need from you. When we hold this big meeting and I ask questions, if there's any, ask Mm -hmm. for questions, Mm -hmm. I want you three to volunteer. Right. And they said, sure, but why? I said, well, for two reasons. One, there's other people in the room with that concern or question. Mm -hmm. You give me a chance to answer it. And two, you give me a chance to demonstrate that I can hear something that might be uncomfortable, something other than what I want to hear, mm-hmm. or you think it's something I don't want to hear, and be civil in my response as a leader, listen to it, and respond to it with respect, not striking out. And so we had that big meeting, and I asked for questions, How many questions do you think there were? 
I'm I'm going to go ahead then and say maybe around seven or ten. Three. After. So it didn't go past those three. It didn't go past the three. So huh. if they had not stood up, nobody would have said a so th- word. Probably. It, wow. Well, I, at least it did diffuse it. You know that that well, thinking process. But it, the others, I thought it might have encouraged others to it, ask some stuff. You know, <laughs> it, it might have. Yeah. But maybe those were the three main questions they sure, had. Sure. Sure. I'll never know for sure. Mm-hmm. But the point is, as a leader, yeah. you sometimes have to set something up. Of that, course, it's yeah. Maybe a yeah. Little, it appears maybe a little manipulative, mm. but not really, because how else are people yeah. going to be heard right. if they're afraid of power mm-hmm. or afraid of embarrassing themselves? I mean, this happens in classes. There yeah. are students that sure. have a question, but they won't ask them. Mm-hmm. I remember as I became more and more confident as a student at the university, University, I would find myself asking questions of the teacher that I knew the answer to because I thought the teacher wasn't clear. Right. And I knew there were other people. And then right. some of the students would say to me, I'm glad you asked that. And I said, well, why didn't you? Well, I thought it would be a dumb question. And I would be Love embarrassed. It. Well, they were okay with me being embarrassed, I guess. But, but I wasn't embarrassed. So right. as a leader, if you're confident in yourself, yeah. but if you also want to be effective, You've got to model the right. civil discourse yourself mm-hmm. as well as hold yourself and other people accountable. Right. And, and really, you know, displaying that behavior and um, not showing defensiveness or some of the other things that could add to that um, shutting down of other thoughts sure. or opinions. I really mean, important. you know, when you see a leader strike out, mm-hmm. um, insult people, Right. Tell them to shut up. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, recently we had an example of Vladimir Putin with one of his advisors bringing up uh, some problems with the invasion of Ukraine, and he basically said, sit down and shut up. Now, when you do that, you know, you don't get any contradictory or no. alternative views that might help you make a better decision. And you also don't model a climate where other people can be civil towards each other. Yeah. So I mean, it's just it's a a huge topic. We've already we've already been chatting for um, over over twenty five minutes on this, and we're it feels like we're just getting warmed up. We could go on and on. (laughs) I know it. It's a it's just an important you know important topic. I like the term you used, productive conflict. And I think that's a great way to look at it. Conflict is going to exist no matter what. It can be productive. Yes. It's important um, to bring to bring people together around those issues and hear each other. I mean, the, the, the thing that I think back to when my Ph.D. program when I took courses in labor industrial relations, and two of the courses were negotiation and collective bargaining. Yeah. And I remember uh, Don Powers was my professor for collective bargaining, and he had been a a uh, UAW negotiator for, for Ford, a um, Ford negotiator for management. And when I had him in class, he was a um, federal mediator huh. to help. And he talked about you can win the negotiation or the bargaining. It lose, win-lose kind of bargaining tactics. But you still have to have a relationship with these people because they're your, your fellow employees. Right. So it's, you know, when I was selling a house and the buyers at the last minute wanted me to cut the price, I was ready to walk away from the table. We didn't have a relationship. Our relationship was this sale, and I'd never see them again. Right. So I was saying, hey, take it or leave it. But when you're, and it doesn't have to be a unionized environment. You're always negotiating. You're always bargaining with people. Do you want to have a long-term relationship with them or not? It, you know, if you're working with them, you have a long-term relationship whether you like it or not. Mm-hmm. Um if you have neighbors, you know, when we had the last presidential election, 60% of the neighbors had Trump signs, 40% had Biden signs. Well, we had a picnic from a 
Memorial Day after, and everybody in the neighborhood was there. Didn't matter what their sign was, mm -hmm. because we have a long-term relationship with each other. So, um, you know, that's that's your self-interest in uh, civility. Yeah, that's really the goal, um, to be able to be civil, no matter what. Uh, as, as we wind it down, is there anything else that you'd like to share for this episode with our listeners? <laughs> well, um, it's, I guess that the, the moral of the story, whether you're on Facebook or face-to-face -face or on a phone or whatever, is start with the idea that the other person who's disagreeing with you is not crazy, mm. ignorant, or evil. They, they just disagree with you. And try to discover why and understand. You may never agree. Uh, now, there are some people who are crazy, and some are ignorant, and there are some evil people. But most of us aren't those things most of the time. And it's so easy, you know, back to where we started, mm -hmm. to just reject the other because we automatically assume if you disagree with me, you must be one of those things. Yeah. Good advice. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep that in mind <laughs> as I, as I just stay nice and quiet on my social media and put up photos of my dogs. <laughs> but, but thank you um, for sharing some, some more of your thoughts um, from your journey and about the important topic of civility uh, really is uh, something we're going to stay focused on this year at the Chamber of Commerce and hope that we can make a difference and a little bit of a difference and a little bit of a dent in how people are thinking, you know, as they interact here. Well, as we had mentioned in a previous conversation, people are so afraid now mm -hmm. that they're not, they're even afraid of talking about being afraid of conflict. Right, right. So good. I'm glad that you're doing this. Thank you. Um, and we're on our way towards more productive conflict. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Yep. And our guest today um, has been Dr. David Sam. He is the former president of Germana Community College here in the Fredericksburg, Virginia region, and now a poet and freelance writer, adjunct professor, editor, mentor, and all-around well-rounded retired human. Just a great person. Thank you for being our guest today, David. And listen, uh, listeners, if you have not already subscribed to the Chambers We Are Business podcast, please go ahead and do so, so you'll know when new episodes are available. And while you're at it, if you could jump over and give us a review so other listeners can find us easily, we would be so appreciative. Thank you, and see you next time. <laughs>